Hello. I hope we are all back. And I think things are working. Am I correct? So uh, I don't know how to tell people who haven't logged back in to log back in, except if you have friends, you know them, you might want to text them. If they log back in, we can get. So do we have this repaired? We think we may have this repaired somewhat. The live, the live, stream, the live stream is working. The live stream is working. So you might want to text those people or get in touch with those people who let you know that the live stream wasn't working and it is working. And we assume that uh, everything else uh, will happen. We're, I'm still giving a little minute, Rachel and Mike, to, to make sure we can get everybody back on because I want everybody to be present for this. I've been waiting all morning for this presentation. That's the literal truth. I really was going to do this differently. I'll talk about it in a minute than why we're doing it. Can we go ahead and begin, do you think? Okay. Bachman's. Hi, I'm Rachel Bachman, senior pastor at Oak Lawn United Methodist Church. And I'm uh, Mike Bachman. I'm the pastor for Union Coffee. Uh, and we, as a married couple, are one of the probably few folks that get to stand at a microphone together at annual conference this year. Um, we share a lot, not only a quarantine bubble. Um, we share uh, child-raising responsibilities. We share a bathroom. And um, she was even kind enough to share you know, a toothbrush with me last week when we, I forgot to bring mine on a short little trip. Um, we share a lot together, um, but we also share things together in ministry because we operate on the same corner, uh, Oak Lawn and Cedar Springs in Dallas. In ministry, one of the things that we get to share together sometimes is congregants. Um, congregants who add particular beautiful aspects to both of our ministries. And so today we get to honor one of those congregants, Billie Jean Baker. We're really excited to have the opportunity to share with you her story because she embodies so much of what is critical to evangelism. Uh, John Wesley and the early Methodist movement were so clear in identifying that we can't feed the soul of somebody until we make sure that their body has been fed as well. And Billie Jean embodies that spirit of evangelism so closely. We're excited to share her story with you all. It is our great joy to celebrate Billie Jean Baker as she receives this award. I help people because it's the right thing to do. I've had a lot of help over the years myself, and there's a lot of people that are just like me that don't know how to ask for help. So if I go and offer it to them, then they're more comfortable and they're able to get the help they need. And the reason why I do it is because I know it's the next right thing to do. And that's what God tells us all to do is to do the next right thing and that makes him happy. So in the end, it'll make me happy. Billie Jean finds ways to take care of people's spiritual and physical needs. And that's what it means to be a Methodist. I came to the church here and I was sleeping on the property and I thought, well, if I'm going to sleep on the church property, I, I, I like the church service anyways, I ought to attend church. And, for some reason, the rest of the homeless community wanted to follow my lead and follow me through the doors. It was a Sunday morning in late December that Billie Jean came up to me between worship services and said, Pastor, I want to talk to you about maybe the possibility that I could come inside tonight. You know, I, I kept blankets and clean clothes and stuff, so I stayed warm, but there was a lot of homeless out here on the streets that were freezing to death overnight because they didn't acquire the things that I had. So I, I was singing in the choir here and, and going to church. And the night before, I had had, on a Saturday night, I had three of the homeless see me walking around and, and tell me, well, I'm a member of this big old church. Why don't I go and see if they'll open the doors and let them sleep inside? So the next morning at 8 o'clock that morning, when they opened the church doors, I went in and I grabbed Reverend Rachel's arm and I said, come, I need to talk to you. She said, no, I need to go. I said, no, no, this is important. It's life and death. One thing led to another. And by the time we had our next service, we announced that we would open for our very first shelter on that evening. And we're able to rally folks to come and volunteer in that next service. We had food and everything. And the church doors were open for the first time. And people slept right there in the sanctuary on the floor and on the pews. And it, it, it's gone on since. That 
The moment was groundbreaking for us here at Oakwan. It set the path for us to welcome people inside, not just on freezing nights and not just for shelter, but also for a place of community and to experience what it is to be loved. And so I'm so grateful for the witness of Billie Jean, not just in paving the way for us to open shelter, but also for building connections and relationships with so many people who found themselves in very very similar circumstances to her. I believe that's my calling to, to help the homeless folks and other people hear the word of God and you know just just be able to I stand up for those that can't stand up for themselves because I have a loud voice and I have pink hair so people are going to pay attention to me. I didn't know we would end up with like a campus of union at the Valencia apartments but in many ways that's what's happened because she brings our worship there. Since we have the pandemic and most of your churches are not open and stuff, I have a Bluetooth speaker and Union does their church service live on Facebook and I hook it up to my Bluetooth speaker and I set it outside. There, there's three little Latino children. They can't go to church because of the pandemic right now. So I play the church service for the Union on Sundays and, and Tuesday nights. And they'll come outside and they like the Misfit Band and they like to hear God's Word. One of the little girls even brings her Bible all the time. And then I even have a lot of my other neighbors that will come out on their porches and stuff because it's on a Bluetooth speaker and they can hear it just so they can hear the Word of God. Billie Jean has continued to be exactly that kind of evangelistic spirit that you pray that your congregants will be. I'm really grateful for the ways that Billie Jean is in ministry, the way that she's made Union and Oak Lawn better churches and more faithful to the calling that Jesus puts upon our lives. So, Billy Jean, it's my pleasure to present to you the Harry Denman Evangelism Award. Uh, and so I want to give this to you in a pen and a certificate. And what I want to say to you is, is this sort of the premier award for evangelism in the United Methodist Church? Because Harry Denman is a person who never met a, um, a stranger and was always witnessing to them about Jesus. And that is exactly what you've been doing. This has been an inspiring video that we've seen. And I want to thank you for your witness and what you do. And I want to thank Rachel and Mike also for bringing uh, Billie Jean and, and uh, uh, helping her uh, find her own gifts and graces and to, to do the work. And so we're grateful for you and your work with Billie Jean and the work that you do in your community and out and Billie Jean. I only wish God made more people like you. So bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Bishop and members of the annual conference, it's my honor to bring to you a report from the Committee on Nominations. I first would like to thank the members of the conference nominating committee for their faithfulness and commitment to the work. This was a quadrennial year, which means that we had well over 100 different positions to fill. The members of this hardworking committee this year were our four district superintendents, a layperson elected from each district, from the East District, Becky Keegans, Metro District, Eric Markinson, North Central District, Leslie Maynard, Northwest District, Trumanel Maples. Also the Vice Chair and Conference Lay Leader, Jeff Buis, our Conference Lay Leader elect, Kim Brannon, and I served as our Chair. The nominations report may be found in full on pages 58 through 64 in your conference workbook. The newly nominated positions and also Bishop McKee's new appointments appear in bold in the report. Since the report was published several weeks back in the conference workbook, two additions and two changes have come to light. I'd like to share those with you now. First, the two changes under the Board of Ordained Ministry Please add Jack Soper to the, to the class of 2024. 
and also add Pam Liston to be nominated to serve as the conference chancellor. The changes are both uh, related to campus ministries. Under the Texas A&M Commerce Wesleyan Campus Ministry, please note that Carol Walker has stepped down from her chair position and will remain on the board and that Mary Brooke Kassad will has agreed to serve as the new chair. And under the Denton Wesley Foundation, Kent Carpenter, already a member of the board, has agreed to serve as the new chair. We're grateful for the people who responded to our request at last year's annual conference and completed a profile sheet. Profile sheets convey to the committee people's areas of interest and serve as the first and primary resource for the committee's work. Of the people who completed a profile sheet, 63% were nominated and are included in the report before you today. I do want to note as well that the committee went about their work with special attention to create a slate that would reflect the diversity of our mission fields and North Texas Conference. The profile sheets not used this year will remain in our database and will be taken into consideration in the 2021 nominations process. To submit a fresh profile sheet or to submit one for the first time for the 2021 process, please go to the North Texas Conference website ntcumc.org forward slash ac hyphen nominations and you can complete one of those by mid-january bishop mckee i present to you and the annual conference the 2020 nominations report for approval okay thank you andy lewis we appreciate that jeff lewis as the conference lay leader thank you for serving as the vice chair of that committee as well and we appreciate the work so this is before you are there any other additional nominations i see none so we are going to vote using the hand function it actually it's a poll we got a poll for you oh got a excuse me i have a poll yes or no and you can vote either at this at the time thanks it takes a village for Bishop McKee, that's all I'm gonna say. So if you would approve the Committee on Nominations report, will you vote yes? If you do not approve, will you vote no? You will vote now, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna move. Don't move. It's not taking the vote. It's not. Bishop announced ten seconds. Huh? Announced ten seconds. They say it's not taking the vote. It says hosts and panelists cannot vote, so maybe we can't for some reason. Okay. Okay. okay so ninety-two percent are reporting that all of this is so it's unanimous. So who's the committee? Just panelists. That's like five. Okay. okay. So is it close? We cl we're going to close the vote uh, right now. We've discovered that people can't vote right now, and the people can't vote are the panelists. That's all of us are up here. So I think we'll be okay at this time. Unanimous 90%. So it's unanimous. It is passed. Ninety-two percent. The others were unable or did not vote. Okay. So that has been adopted. I want to thank the work for that. I do want to say, uh, take a, this just a moment for a personal word. Uh, this is Jeff Buis's last act as the conference lay leader. If you look at the nominations report, you see that he's going to be serving on the board of Ordain Ministry. But Jeff Buis has been a just one of the privileges of being the bishop in this conference is just the fine lay leadership. And I, I, I want to take this time to thank Jeff uh, for the work he's done. And we're around the table at a cabinet and he offers things. It's just, it is just so insightful and very good. And I said last night in a meeting, a uh, circle of the extended cabinet before we came in here that one of the things that, um, just to know that every time we gather as a cabinet, we have a devotional to begin the day. And every time that Jeff uh, brings the devotional, it is, is absolutely just so uh, formative, even for our own spiritual journey. And as many of you know, Jeff is a spiritual director uh, in addition to his day job and his other 
non-paid job as the lay leader of the North Texas Conference, and it's like it was always a little course in some church history that I may have forgotten or didn't know and or any number of things about it. So, Jeff, we're, we're going to miss you, but we're, we know that you're ever-present in the North Texas Conference. So I want to thank you, and I'd like for everybody to thank Jeff Buis for his four years and three months as lay leader of the annual conference. Chef, go yeah, ahead. Just a moment of privilege for myself. Uh, I just want to say what an honor and a privilege it has been to serve with you, Bishop, and the cabinet and the Board of Laity, and all the members of this great North Texas Annual Conference. Um, it's been a lot of work, but it's also been a lot of fun. And I am so grateful for the support of so many people, especially my family, that have had to put up with a lot of long hours from me. Um, we have a very strong church. We have a strong conference. And I just feel lucky and blessed uh, to have been able to play some small part in the life of the church. So thank you. And I really look forward to the years uh, ahead in this great conference. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I want to introduce to you our new conference lay leader, uh, Kim Brannon, who's a member of University Park United Methodist Church. And uh, Kim, if you'd like to say something, you may. And so welcome. We're glad you're going to be with us. Thank you, Bishop. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, I just want to say hello. I want to introduce myself to everyone. Um, I will come to know you, uh, and it's been, it'll be my great privilege to do that. It's my privilege also to be welcomed into this cabinet and to stand on the shoulders of those who have come before me. I'm very grateful for that and very grateful for Jeff who has really, really taken me under his wing this past year. I've learned a lot and um, we, we share a lot of vision for this conference regarding lay leadership, and it's my privilege to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Jeff. We appreciate so very much. We're going to continue the business of the annual conference, and I'm at Jody Smith is uh, next on the agenda. She serves as our Co Connectional Resources Director. Uh, many of you know that Jody is going to retire at the end of October, and so some people are wondering, well, why didn't we recognize her? But we're recognizing people, we're, you know, we've moved three months beyond when this is supposed to happen. So uh, Jody will be recognized for retirement along with retirees uh, next year. So it's, it's really, um, Jody, I need to tell you, it's sort of a, there's a method to my madness on this too. I think that I can, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering if I can get more, you know, you just, well, maybe you want to do this the middle of November or the last of November or the end of the year or January. So we can close out the year, but Jody, you can speak now, but please don't respond to what I just said at all. <laughs> at this, yeah. Well, thank you, Bishop. And hello again, uh, Bishop and the members of the North Texas Annual Conference. Uh, I do, I will be bringing legislation, or my center's bringing legislation for four different areas. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with the equitable compensation legislation. Uh, it's legislative item number three. It's found on page 18 through 21 in your workbooks. The legislation recommends the apportion budget for 2021 for equitable compensation be set at $50,832 and the associated subsidies for pension and health insurance at $12,000 and $22,000 $22, Eight hundred, respectively, for a total apportioned budget of eighty-five thousand six hundred and thirty-two. Furthermore, the legislation sets forth the uh, minimum compensation for an elder or deacon, and we are recommending that that be uh, remain flat at fifty thousand two hundred and thirty-six dollars, and that the minimum compensation for a local pastor serving full time be set or remain flat at forty-four thousand. $360. The percentage change in the minimum compensation uh, has been historically tied to the recommended change in the DS salaries. And for 2021, CFNA is recommending that we suspend the standing rules related to the uh, increase in that amount, which would have been 1.85%, and just keep that flat. You will see that in a few minutes when you see the budget that we are keeping all of the salaries flat. Since uh, these are all tied together, it, uh, it seemed appropriate to uh, keep the minimum compensation also flat. So Bishop, the Center for Leadership Development, and the CFNA recommend the adoption of this legislation to the annual conference. Okay, this is a motion uh, related to equitable comp, as Jody Smith has said. 
Um, I would like for you to get ready to vote. We're going to give, uh, Ben Hensley said that there is not enough time. And so I'm going to honor that uh, point of order by telling you we're going to vote soon. And if you're going to, uh, then in, we're going to call for the vote. We're going to give you 30 seconds to vote yes or no on the poll. Do you approve legislative item number three? as found in the workbook that is before you and that has been explained. So you're ready to vote. Vote now, yes or no. You have 30 seconds. Yeah, call for when you're ready, yeah. Six hundred eighty-seven to twelve. What, but has everybody voted? Oh, everybody has voted. So, if, you, if and so it is passed. Six hundred eighty-seven to twelve. Okay, Judy. So I have been very fortunate to have some fabulous uh, people serving on the various teams that I oversee and very competent and capable leaders for those teams. In a minute, each uh, three teams will be represented by their chairs. And I, I just want to say thank you to all of them. And in the interest of time, I'm going to very quickly say who they are and the order that they're coming up in. Uh, Ann Willett, Reverend Ann Willett will be presenting the Board of Pensions budget. Uh, Reverend uh, Chris Yost will be presenting the trustee legislation. And then finally, uh, Larry Womack will be coming to you with our budget. So I'm very grateful to all of them for their work, for their service, and their competence, and their friendship. Hello friends, I'm Ann Willett. I'm Executive Minister at First United Methodist Dallas and also ch chair the Board of Pensions for our conference. I bring you greetings from the Board of Pensions and also some good news today. I'd like to announce that we are going to extend a one month holiday on all health, dental, and vision premiums for the month of October. This is very good news. The holiday is for both pastors and their dependents if family coverage is provided. So please check your October bill and ministers please tell your treasurer or financial administrator to check the October bill because it will be lower and better. Remember that in November those premiums will return to the previous amount. Again, churches will not be charged for health, dental, and vision premiums for clergy independence for the month of October. Good news from the Board of Pensions. The health insurance rates for next year have come in, and our 2021 rates for the default plan charged to the local church will increase by $6 a month. Given national health insurance trends, we are pleased that the rate increase is minimal. That comes to 0.7% increase. We also have two items on the consent agenda today, the comprehensive benefit funding plan and the retiree housing allowance. These are legislative items that are found on pages 25 and 23 in your conference workbook, and they will be handled with the uh, consent agenda. We do need to vote on two items today. One is legislative item number four, found on pages 21 to 23, and it presents the budget for 2021. The total change is about a half a percent decrease. The amount budgeted was lowered to align more closely to the actuals for the last few years on a couple of line items. We also need to vote on another legislative item, Item number six, found on page 24 of the workbook. 
The board recommends the pre-82 service rate remain at the current amount of $802 per year of pre-82 service. We normally increase this rate by the amount of cost of living adjustment, but given the financial challenges faced by our churches and our members, we are recommending that this amount remain unchanged for the current year. Next year, we will address any increases with our 22 rate adjustments. We have two, these two items, item number four and number six for your approval, and they will be on the same page. Bishop, that concludes our report. Okay, so we have two items to vote on one poll question, and so I want to remind you of that. I want to know, does anybody have a question for Ann Ann Willett or Jody Smith related to this report and these votes that we're soon to take? I don't see any, so we're going to vote. So the first item is item number four. Do you approve legislative item number four? It's on the Board of Pensions and Health Benefits apportionment budget as found in the what workbook. We're gonna vote, and then we're gonna take another vote on the next item after this, but we're gonna take a vote, and this is on a poll, and so you can vote yes or no when the voting begins. And I'm getting ready to begin the voting. You'll have 30 seconds. Uh, to do this, so prepare to vote. If you will approve item number four, will you vote yes? If you don't approve of item number four, will you vote no? Take six here in a minute if we're ready to vote. Are we ready to vote on six? Are we ready to vote on six? We're now going to vote on vote item number six. And if you will approve legislative item number six, will you vote yes? Vote no if you don't approve. Seconds are left. Is it close? Okay. Let's have the numbers. Um, so item number four has passed. We're going to give you the numbers. 720 in favor to four against. 720 in favor and four against. And item number, legislative item number six. Passed 713 in favor. 713 in favor. 12 against. And 12 against, so it passes as well. Thank you, Ann. Good work. Appreciate it. Hello church, my name is Chris Yost and I have the privilege of serving at Wesley United Methodist Church in Greenville, Texas and as the chairperson of the Conference Board of Trustees. I first want to say a huge word of thanks to all of our conference trustees who I'd love to see in this room with us here today and I also want to take a moment and say thank you to all of you who serve in the local church and the, your board of trustees. We know this year has been extremely hard on you to be prayerful in your discernment about opening practices and just a tip of the hat thank you for all of your work and as a personal note um, Reverend Jody Smith is both a, a personal friend and a great colleague and Jody we're gonna miss you uh, who else could be a CPA and an elder uh, mind-boggling but thank you 
Uh, today we're going to be taking up legislative item number 11. That'll be found on pages 44 through 56 in your conference workbooks. Now, legally, churches in the annual conference function as nonprofit corporations. A corporation's bylaws and articles of, in, of formation should be reviewed every 10 years or so as changes in our book of discipline, state laws, county laws, particularly as it relates to property tax exemptions. The North Texas Conference bylaws have not been updated in over a decade. The proposed legislation is to bring our church, our current bylaws into alignment with changes made in all three of those areas. We also have a provision to codify our use of technology for meetings and voting. While this is broadly covered under Texas state law, we are ensuring it is directly covered under our own conference bylaws. These changes have been vetted with a real estate attorney who is licensed in the state of Texas, legal counsel for GCFNA, then reviewed and approved by our conference trustees. We do want to take this moment to encourage each and every church, each and every institution in the North Texas Conference to review your own bylaws and articles of formation to make certain that they are in compliance with current laws and the current book of discipline. If you have not updated your bylaws or articles of formation in the last 15 years, there are certainly some areas that you do need to update in your church documents. The most pressing issue as we function as a part of this good world that we live in is that uh, you maintain your property tax exemption. Can I get an amen? Several of our churches have already had to respond to challenges by local tax authorities recently to confirm that they still are in compliance with current laws. The guidance is found on page 44 of the conference workbook. And it will help you take a look at to confirm that current tests are met in your local church. What does that mean? Well, tests are simply the criteria that taxing authorities are looking for to ensure that you can demonstrate or satisfy the requirements uh, of being a tax exempt organization. Now, Reverend Jody Smith has made it clear, and I need to reiterate, that the conference office cannot provide specific legal aid and advice to every church, uh, to this matter, in all of our local churches. There is, however, a sample that may be found, a sample of bylaws and articles of formation that have produced, been produced by GCFA. Those can be found on the conference website and should appear on your screen. They can be found at ntcumc.org slash church and then look up sample bylaws and articles of formation. Bishop, the trustees of the annual conference recommend passage of legislative item number 11 found in the conference workbook for the amendment of the bylaws of the North Texas Annual Conference. Thank you, Chris. We do have a motion uh, to refer this from William Bill Lawrence. And um, so, um, Bill, are you, are you on now? And I'll let you speak to this and make the motion. Uh, I am on. Uh, can I be heard? You're heard. All right. Uh, my motion is to refer legislative item 11, specifically the proposed revision of the bylaws, for further study. Uh, and by the motion to refer, I specifically suggest uh, that the referral for study uh, be to the Board of Ordained Ministry and to the Annual Conference Council on Finance and Administration. If there is a second, I'll speak to it. Okay, do we have a second? We have a second. We have a second. So, Dr. Lawrence, please speak. Thank you, Bishop, and thanks to the seconder. As I studied the uh, presentation of the workbook uh, and I reflected on it, I certainly have no objection to the basic premise, which is that the need for changes in the bylaws uh, occurs from time to time and 
the revisions must be entertained periodically. I am specifically concerned, however, about certain items that I believe need further study and that prompt me to make this motion to refer. I will simply cite uh, two examples that exist in various places in the document. Uh, for example, on page 47 of the conference workbook at line 22, uh, the text uh, refers to the corporation as the basic body of the church. That strikes me as unwise language that needs further reflection and possible further revision because the corporation is not uh, the basic body of the church. The annual conference is, according to paragraph 33 of the Constitution of the United Methodist Church. If an annual conference incorporates itself or forms a corporation by discipline, by church law, the corporation is subsidiary to the annual conference. They cannot be identical. Further, the way the text is currently written, page 47, line 22, uh, it suggests that the language which is present in the current document uh, could be construed as an amendment uh, to the Constitution, paragraph 33. Obviously, an annual conference does not have the authority to amend the denomination's Constitution. Uh, the uh, process for amending the Constitution begins at the General Conference when a, an amendment is adopted by a two-thirds vote, and then it goes to the annual conferences for their aggregate two-thirds vote if it's to be approved. As a second example of the need for further study, I will cite uh, page 52 of the uh, workbook at line 10, uh, which uh, makes reference to the fact that the bishop of the North Texas Conference would become the CEO of the corporation. Uh, this has, in my mind, no reference to any particular individual bishop. It certainly doesn't refer to the current bishop. It just refers to the office of bishop uh, of the North Texas Conference as the CEO of the corporation. I do not uh, think that as it stands without further study, we can accept that because uh, uh, by the constitution of the church, the bishop is not and cannot ever be a member of the annual conference. The bishop's membership is in the council of bishops. Bishops are assigned to uh, Episcopal areas, they preside at annual conferences, but I'm concerned about the use of the language of CEO on page 52, line 10. I have other concerns as well, but I simply offer these two citations and my additional comments as um, uh, a reason for asserting that I think this needs further study, and I think the two bodies that I mentioned the Board of Ordained Ministry can look at the draft from the standpoint of how it impacts uh, clergy members of the annual conference and the Conference Council on Finance and Administration can provide further study uh, specifically looking at such questions as the legal and financial implications of creating the corporation in the form in which this document currently exists. So again, my motion is to refer this document for further study. Thank you. This mo the, the motion to refer is, is uh, what is before us. I'm gonna ask Chris Yost to speak to it now. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, tremendous respect for you. Um, I, I, I'm sitting here laughing, thinking about me sharing more with you. Um, tip of the hat. I do want to point out on your first uh, uh, question or, or point of, of clarification uh, that you had, the reference to the annual conference as a corporation is in perfect keeping with this document. If you notice on page 45, uh, 
You'll look at line 18, actually you can start at uh, line 13 and 14, where the North Texas Conference is assigned for the purpose of this document as the corporation. The reference to annual conference refers to this gathering of the body for the purposes of this document. I think on the first one that, that would address what you're asking for. Your second point that you made, I do not know the answer to that. I've uh, asked uh, Reverend Jody Smith to come up and speak to that on um, page. 52, I think you said it was, um, under the bishop as the CEO. Um, anyway, let me let you say a word about that. And I'm going to ask for some input from our chancellor and our bishop. But when I look through all of our documents, they all list the bishop of the North Texas Annual Conference as the president of the corporation. Even though he's not a member, he, he is listed as the president. So that is the reason for that language. Do either of you have any feedback for that? Do I? Mm -hmm. So, um, I've been t so I think that each bishop has been referred to as the president of that particular conference. I mean, I signed the documents as that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, I will say that we are, I, I, I'm seen as the president of the conference. Yes. So I agree with you that he's not a member of the conference, but he is listed as the president. So I, I don't see a conflict with that particular item. I would like to note that um, a real estate attorney here in Texas, um, over 30 years of experience, he and I spent um, two different sessions, two hours each, with the general counsel at GCFNA going over these documents with a fine tooth comb, trying to, um, to really dig deep with each word. And the, the changes that are being um, suggested here, I was going to wait till next year until I realized I was retiring this year. So I wanted to be able to try to, to push, you know, to talk about it this year because I have uh, more experience with it. The, uh, the language that was in the original document, was, it was drafted in 1980 when uh, the, the discipline only referenced the trustees of the annual conference. There, the annual conference itself was not incorporated. We are currently incorporated both as trustees and as an annual conference. And the way the original wording in 1980 was placed, it quite honestly gives the Board of Trustees um, deferential power over this body. And that is not the intent of of what we are trying to do. So this language is in line with the 2016 Book of Discipline that um, affirms and confirms that the, uh, the ability to amend the bylaws, the ability to make any decisions are made by this body and not the trustees. I believe that there is more work that will need to be done on these articles and, and the bylaws. Uh, I just wanted to get the main part of it done and cleaned up before I left. And so I, I would like to offer a friendly amendment um, to, to recognize that there is more work to be done and certainly uh, refer this to the Board of Ordained Ministry and to uh, CFNA for further review for the items that uh, Dean Lawrence has raised. Um, I don't know whether to rule that out of order or not, but it's like this is what's enforced. I don't think we can amend this piece. Am okay. I correct, Pam? I am correct. So my chancellor says I'm right, so we can't amend this. So this is the only thing that's before us. We're not talking about the body work, whether we're going to refer this or not. So I want everybody to be clear about what we are doing at this time. Is voting on the motion to refer to the bodies that were mentioned, G excuse me, CFNA and the uh, Board of Ordained Ministry, okay? So that's what for us. 
I'm gonna, I want to, by the way, I know there are several points of order here, and what I would like to do is complete this vote on this referral before we get to the points of order. That may take care of some of them. It may not. So let's do that, okay? So are you ready to vote on the motion to refer? Bill, do you want to speak any more you, you, to your motion? Uh, just to add uh, one thing, uh, I uh, recognize that both current uh, language and some other language use the term a president, but that's consistent with the role of a bishop in an annual conference because a president presides. The addition of the phrase CEO, chief executive officer, could be taken to imply that the bishop has the power to act on behalf of the annual conference. That's one of the many aspects of this document that concerns me and calls me again to request further study. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I want all of you to prepare to vote, and we're going to vote on the motion to refer that is before you. That's been very clear. Uh, we'll just, it's, it's the document basically will be referred to CFNA and to the Board of Ordained Ministry. So I want you to prepare to vote. It's a yes or no on referral. If you vote yes, then there'll be no more consideration to refer, then no more consideration of this document at this meeting at this time. So that's what we're getting ready to do is vote. If you vote no, then we'll still consider the document and move through several points of order related to the document at that time. Okay? So I want you to prepare to vote. Hand raise. We're going to do a hand raise vote on this. So there'll be a, we'll take a yes and then we'll take the no's. So uh, are you ready to vote? We're going to vote in five seconds. If you vote for the motion to refer, will you vote yes? Vote now. You have 20 seconds to vote yes. Hmm? How many? Ten, ten seconds more. Ten seconds more. Okay, that is closed. If you want to vote no, not until we finish. If you want to vote no on the referral, then vote now. You have 20 seconds. Ten seconds left. Okay, it is closed. We're going to report the vote totals. So the motion passed 465 to 171. Okay, the motion to refer passed 465 to 171. 171. So this is referred, so this no longer is before us. So I ha see several points of order, and just as a matter, what I want to say is, is that we will make notations of these. They address to this. Um, uh, then we're, since the legislation not before us is being referred, then they will be referred along with the referral to that. So we will not, we will not take these points of order up. Is that, am I right about that, Pam? Okay. I've checked with the chancellor and uh, that is correct. So Chris, thank you for your work. Jody, thank you for your work. And we will refer these to the, uh, to that which is mentioned and conform to that. Bill, thank you for bringing that. We'll go to now the CFNA report. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, my name is Larry Womack. I am a lay member of the annual conference out of First United Methodist Church in Rockwall. And it's been my 
pleasure to uh, work also with Reverend Jody Smith in her capacity as the director of the Center for Connectional Resources for many years. Um, I first worked with Jody on the Board of Pensions, uh, wound up uh, as chair of that board for a little while, and have um, worked for the last several years with her in this role as president of the Council on Finance and Administration. And uh, Jody's done remarkable work, and Jody, we wish you well in your retirement. Um, also want to thank the team that Jody has put together at the conference office. Um, I don't think you could have a better set of resources in a uh, conference office environment um, to do the work that um, her teams do in support of the local churches and support of these uh, committees that do this work of the church that's there. And so we really appreciate that. I also want to take just a second to thank also the members of the Council on Finance Administration, the clergy and lay members of the CFNA, um, who particularly over the last several months just as all of you have been doing, have uh, done yeoman's work in some really, really unusual times. And so I want to thank those folks uh, for their, their efforts as well as we come before you today. Bishop, the legislative items from CFNA are found on pages 36 through 43 of the conference workbook under legislative item number eight. The first legislative item that we present today is that the CFNA recommends the continued engagement of Ratliff and Associates for the 2020 audit of all corporate entities consolidated under the leadership of the North Texas Annual Conference. And these entities are the North Texas Conference, the Board of Pensions, the Prothrow Center, and the Bridgeport Center. The second uh, legislative item is the uh, proposed budget, which is found on pages 39 through 42 of the workbook. Um, this is a little different environment. I don't know, are we considering both of those in one vote or are there two votes on these items? Do we know? Um. Can you wait and let me answer sure. the keeper of the vote? I'll, I'll, I'll just move on then and we'll, we'll uh, go from there. Just a little bit of background. Um, but Larry, everything for CFNA is one vote, so we can okay. go ahead and take those. So which one would remind us again, what would you like for us to vote on now? Um, the, the first vote would be on the recommendation of the continued engagement of Ratliff and Associates for um, the role as auditor for the 2020 audit. And this is legislative item number, number eight. Number eight. So we are going to vote on legislative item number eight and is to recommend uh, what is before you as our auditors. Uh, Larry has explained that. So I want to remind you about the hand function. Andy, actually, I'm going to ask Andy Lewis to remind us about the hand function. So some people are having some challenges with the hand function. So we think we know how to help. Thank you, Bishop. I would remind us that the raise hand function is found along the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen in the center. And so if you'll hover your cursor uh, over the bottom of your screen, the raise hand function will appear. If you click that, that is a way to record your vote. Thank you. Okay, we're voting to approve the auditors. We do this annually. If you will vote to approve the auditors, get ready to vote, find the hand function. I'll call for the yes votes, and then after, after 20 seconds, I'll call for the no votes on this. Get ready to vote. If you will approve the request for the auditors, will you vote yes now? You have 20 seconds. Ten seconds in. Ten seconds, Ten seconds to go. What is it? Okay, if you're going to vote no to on the approval of the auditors, will you vote now? You have twenty seconds. Bishop, you can pause. They have, to, they have to clear the deck. Oh, they have to, excuse me, just wait. Yeah, they have to clear the deck. Tell me when. Are they ready? Okay, if you want to vote no on the auditors, will you vote now by raising the hand?
seconds. You have 10 seconds remaining to vote no. Yes. <laughs> okay, Christopher, ready. Okay, they both. It passes. Okay, the motion passes by. 646 in favor. 646 in favor. Seven no. Seven no. Larry, to continue. All right, thank you. As we turn our attention uh, toward the 2020 budget, just want to give just a little bit of background because this has been such an unusual year, um, not only for the CFNA, but for all of you and, uh, and your churches. After we set the budget, uh, actually, I will say that CFNA actually set the budget for 2021 in February prior to all of the uh, issues coming forward with uh, COVID-19 and all the potential impacts that were there. Um, so uh, we knew that we were going to have to relook at the budget, make adjustments, and um, and see how we were going to carry forward with a financial plan for the conference for 2021. And as such, the CFNA, Bishop, the members of the cabinet, and I'm sure all of you and your local churches began looking for ways to lessen the financial impacts of what we were seeing as a result of COVID, and then figure out ways to respond to what was going on. And uh, so like many of you, some of the actions that were taken, um, the conference was able to secure a uh, payroll protection loan, which appears uh, thankfully that 100% of that will be uh, reviewed as uh, being able to uh, be forgiven at the end of its term. Westpath also came forward and announced a three month holiday in the uh, CPP premiums, which also provided some cash flow relief um, to the conference at this period of time. Uh, CFNA has continued to monitor the budget on a monthly basis, and it appears that we will actually finish the year with the, approximately the same amount of uh, funds in reserve as we had coming into the year. Bishop, I think that's pretty miraculous myself under the circumstances, but it's great work um, by the staff to uh, keep our reserves in that kind of uh, condition, um, including these uh, opportunities that we have had um, throughout the year. So uh, we were able to receive that uh, payroll protection loan. The Westpath premium holiday helped. Um, your conference staff also did some things to consolidate functions and reduce staff, which also had significant contributions uh, to alleviating upward pressures on the budget. We also had some changes and some terminations of some programming that was being offered that allowed for some savings as well. And the conference staff also um, had a, a pretty dramatic reduction in travel and expenses as the uh, quarantine issues and issues of the um, um, virus were taking hold around the conference. Um, from an income standpoint, North Texas Conference recorded a payout of 90.2 percent of the total apportionments for 2019. Uh, the apportionments, apportionments received were about 6 percent below our 10-year average of receipts on, on apportionments. We did have a few churches that opted to escrow their apportionment payments as a result and in response to the 2019 general conference activities uh, rather than remitting those funds in their usual basis to the conference treasury. However, several of those churches did remit um, those escrow payments by checkout time in January. Uh, so the total paid apportionments uh, was 11 million, approximately 565,000, and uh, we also had uh, payments for benevolent causes beyond the apportionments of right at $300,000. So uh, uh, to recap, going into the budget, we closed 2019 with that apportionment payout of 90%. Um, but we were also very grateful to receive the apportionment payments that were given considering the circumstances that we were under. It appears that we're on pace um, for about that same level of performance in 2020, and we're kind of expecting a payout of around 90%. So uh, going into the budget, the proposed budget for 2021. Um, there we go. You can see at the uh, top of the screen, 
Um, from a jurisdictional and general conference perspective on the apportionments, there's a significant decrease in that uh, apportioned uh, amount coming to the North Texas Conference this year, reduction of approximately 28%. As you go down um, through the um, different centers at the conference level, you'll see about a 14% decrease in the Center for Church Development, a 4% increase from the Center of Leadership Development, about a 4% in decrease from the Center for Missional Outreach, a uh, effectively flat budget for the Center for Connectional Resources, and about a 4% increase from communications, about a percent and a half decrease from uh, the district superintendents for an annual conference total um, reduction in budget from the annual conference perspective of 4.02% and total apportioned and budgeted expenses, a decrease uh, from 20 to 21 of 11.61%. Um, just a couple of other issues to mention as we uh, look at the numbers here. Um, we, we are showing the annual conference budget of a decrease of about 4%. Um, we accomplished that through a couple of things. Um, we put forward a request to temporarily suspend the standing rules that place the increase to the district superintendent salaries to an amount equal to the average change in pastor's compensation as reported on the prior year checkout. The council is asking that the 1.85% increase be suspended and the district superintendent salary being kept flat at the current rates for 2021. In addition, the other salaries, all other salaries for conference employees will remain flat in 2021, and the remaining reductions to the annual conference budget uh, were brought about by a reduction in a few areas where a conference has been able to streamline and consolidate some expenses. Um, so that uh, are some some actions that we took to try to keep the uh, amount of the budget increase as um, minimal as possible and to bring forth this uh, overall decrease. So, uh, Bishop, North Texas, members of the North Texas Conference, um, the CFNA thanks each and every one of you for your commitment and dedication to both reduce expenses and to continue the work of the church through faithful payment of your apportionments. Well, we're looking forward to that continued. We've really not seen anything like 2020 before, but we're still committed and committed to funding a role in 2021 where we all strive to make disciples for Jesus Christ and the transformation of the world. With that, Bishop, the CFNA recommends adoption of the budget. Okay, thank you. So that is before you. We do want to answer a question that was asked during the Justice and Reconciliation Team report related to where the funding was going to come. We want to use this time, and Andy Lewis is going to address that for us. Thank you, Bishop. It's an honor for me to speak uh, to the question that was raised about funding in the 2021 budget to support the journey toward racial justice uh, efforts by our North Texas Conference. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that there is not a designated line for the journey toward racial justice. In many ways, that is an intentional decision that was discussed by the center directors as we worked on our budgets rather than designate a single line, and we feared risk uh, siloing uh, the work of this, uh, this team, uh, we instead decided uh, to take an approach whereby all of our centers would share in the responsibility for supporting and advancing this important work. And so there are many uh, places in our budget where one could look and uh, rightfully acknowledge that funding is going to support our journey toward racial justice. Uh, I have the honor of directing our Center for Missional Outreach, and I can speak specifically to some of the, the items there. First and foremost, I would want to say that uh, on the Center for Missional Outreach staff, there are two full-time associate directors. Uh, at least one half of each of their job descriptions is devoted solely toward um, advancing our work on the journey toward racial justice. Uh, in addition, if we look at our budget, the Commission on Ethnic and Local Church Concerns, uh, which we supervise, 
um, has a, a budget of over $100,000. All of the expenses there go to support and resource our clergy and lay leaders and congregations uh, that are churches of color. And finally, I would note that our budget contains $55,000 that supports the work of various United Methodist Extension Ministries. Those extension ministries, uh, the focus of their work uh, in many cases is to uh, meet the needs of communities uh, of color uh, and also to come alongside and be in ministry with uh, persons of color. Some of those ministries include Justice for Our Neighbors, Project Transformation, uh, Wesley Rankin Center, and the Dallas Bethlehem Center. Again, overall, I just would want to share that the, that the work of the journey to racial justice and all that it implies uh, is being uh, wholly embraced by each of the centers, um, each of us as directors and our staffs. And so again, while there's not a single line item, all of our centers have significant resources, including financial, that are going to support this work. Bishop? Thank you. I also want to make a report that um, there is, has been some funding that will be made available to the conference from a, from a donor who chooses to remain anonymous that will also be significant as well. So, thank you. So let us vote then on legislative item number eight, which includes the report of the Council on Finance Administration and also includes the budget. And that's been before you and I've seen no questions come up. So I'm getting ready to move to vote. This is going to be a poll. Am I correct about that? Yes. It will be a poll. So I would like for you to uh, get ready to vote. And we're going to vote, uh, if you will, they can vote yet yes or no on a poll, can't they? Okay, at the same time. Oh, it's not like raising hands. Okay, so we're going to vote here in a few in a few seconds, and I'm going to um, tell you that we're going to vote in about 10 seconds, so get ready to vote. Locate the function. It's coming before you. It's coming up, and then we're going to give you 30 seconds to vote. Okay, prepare to vote now. If you prepare, if you vote for legislative item number eight, which includes the budget, vote yes. If you don't approve, vote no. Vote now. You have 10 seconds to vote. Yeah. Okay, the voting is closed. And the, the number of votes for yes are? 686. 686. No, 12. 12 votes, no. It passes. Larry Womack, CFNA, Jody, your team, everybody, thank you for your work on this. We're going to do some announcements, so we are running behind schedule. We're going to do some announcements, then we're going to break for lunch. I'll give you the time about how long we'll need for lunch. So I think at this time, uh, we're going to hear from Judith Reedy. Okay? And then Flor Granillo, please be ready to vote for, I mean, to uh, pray for our break and our lunch. Bishop, the only announcement that we have received so far is for a clergy golf outing on, <clears throat> on Monday, October the 19th at 1 p.m. in Plano. Contact either Matt Gaston or John McClarty for more information and watch for an email for an official invitation. Okay, thank you. And, um, and Allison, how long shall we take? 45 minutes? Sounds good to me. And what do you think? Okay, when we adjourn and after this prayer, we're going to recess for 45 minutes. So we are going to gather again at about um, uh, 1.30. Is that right? So, Floor, are you ready to pray? Lord Raniel, one of our newly commissioned ministers. Is she ready? Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you, Floor.
Should we continue with our conference? I want to say that I am very honored to be part of the United Methodist Church and to be specifically, specifically part of the North Texas Conference now that I am commissioned and to be able to do ministry with you during this unprecedented time. Let us pray, let us bring our hearts together and pray at this moment when we go for lunch. Almighty and loving God, we want to thank you for this day, a historical day in our church and in our lives. We no doubt this is a day that we won't forget. Amid the circumstances of a global pandemic, here we are together responding to your call against all the challenges we are facing right now. We can continue with the task you have entrusted us to take care of your church and your people. So we want to thank you for reassuring us with your love because once more you have provided all the resources and the necessary means for the celebration of this annual conference. For all you do for us, we feel humble and recognize you as our sovereign God and powerful and faithful God that it is bigger than anything else. We pray for strength and we power of the, of the power of the Holy Spirit to continue powering us, empowering us within this time. As we are taking a break for lunch, we pray for your blessings over our food and we pray for it to nurture our bodies and our minds. And we thank you for all things you did to make possible for that food to come to our table. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord, we will reconvene at 1.30. Thank you for your presence. This Everybody come and see. Everybody come and see. God loves kids like you and me. God loves kids like you and me. God won't push me far away. God won't push me far away. In God's love I'll surely stay. think it's great to know that God loves you and me. In God's holy word, it says God always will. God knows everything about me, even knows my name. When I make mistakes, God loves me still. I will sing a thank you song. can sing along. Maybe you can sing along. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for loving me. Loving me so perfectly. Loving me so perfectly. Don't you think it's great to know that God loves you and me? In God's holy word, it says God. God loves me still. Don't you think it's great to know that God loves you and me? In God's holy word, this is what always will. God knows everything about me, even knows my name. When I make mistakes, God loves me.
so we are reconvening, and so we are at uh, an item. I want to be clear about where we are, and that is, is that we are, a, excuse me, I think we have completed everything through, um, I want to be sure. Okay. So we at legislative matters, is that where we are? Is there any leftover items from this morning? Prayer from Lucretia Faison. Lucretia, if you'll be ready, I'm going to ask you to pray in a few moments. We have a center's video. Okay, we have a center's video next. Lucretia, will you pray for us, please? Okay. Lucretia, we gladly hear you pray. To unmute. All right, Bishop, can you hear me now? We can. Welcome. All right. Thank you. Greetings to you and to the members of the North Texas Annual Conference. Let us pray. Loving God, you have called us together for such a time as this. You've called us to be your people for such a time as this. And God, we acknowledge that these are difficult and uncertain days, and that at times the issues before us feel insurmountable. But God, you've given us many gifts, and one of those great gifts is the gift of one another. So Lord, you've called us to face these uncertain times together. You've called us to serve together, to persevere together, to labor together, to build bridges together, because we are recipients of your profound grace. And your grace compels us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves. And God, the only way we can do this is together. So may we truly be your people, the body of Christ, for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I erred in something I said to you. So where we are at this point is uh, we, there are items that were on the agenda for one o'clock. Uh, when we came back and uh, that is the uh, video from the centers and so we'll do that and then we have a commissioning service for a deaconess and uh, and a home missioner and so we'll be doing that before we take up the legislative items so i simply wanted to tell you that so let us now begin and i think we're going to hear from our center directors at this time I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand and your right hand delivers me. In the time when our world our nation and even our denomination is filled with so much bad news and discouraging words. Thankfulness is a powerful weapon of encouragement. It reminds us of the faithfulness of God, of the goodness of God, and emboldens us to face days of uncertainty. Thank you for your faithfulness. You, the North Texas Annual Conference, have given so much during the season. And so we want to thank you for the many ways that you have been faithful. Thank you to our nonprofit partners who from the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic have been on the front lines in ministry with those communities most affected. We thank you for stepping up and helping your peers navigate this new world where we are seeking to reach people through digital mediums. Thank you for pastoring our children and our youth and caring for their greatest needs during this time. Thank you to Project Unity, St. Luke Community United Methodist Church, Hamilton Park United Methodist Church, and Cochrane Chapel United Methodist Church, and all the volunteers who have made free COVID-19 testing available to communities throughout the city of Dallas. We give thanks to our church planters and our multiplying churches 
who are boldly seeking to continue to reach new people in a challenging season. Thank you for your adaptive leadership, for delivering Bibles to third grade children, for taking the sacraments outdoors, for creating new fellowship spaces and learning spaces for youth. Thank you to so many churches for collecting food, distributing food, making hot meals to meet the needs of people who found themselves without food to put on the table during this pandemic. Thank you for the many ways that you reached out to the people of God and took care of their pastoral needs and cared for them. Thank you for being a voice for justice, for standing up for what you believe in and standing up with those whose voices are so often not heard. Thank you for recognizing that being a part of pursuing racial justice and equity is a part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to thank the center directors for their work during uh, the last several months and also uh, the people who work in, the, in those centers and providing uh, the kind of leadership and help in terms of for our churches during this difficult time. And so I want to thank them publicly for the work they do. So Andy, Owen, Jody, and Cammie, thank you very much. We're now coming to a time of the commissioning of a deaconesses and home missioners. And so I'm proud that these two people are standing with me today and I'll introduce them in a moment. Well, I'll tell that Jonah Ballesteros and Rosel Justo Sale are with us this afternoon. So, friends in Christ, we rejoice that you responded to God's call and ministry as a deaconess home missioner of the United Methodist Church. In your ministry, you continue a tradition of service that is as vital today, maybe even more so, as it was in 1888 when the office of deaconess was first authorized in the Methodist tradition. The call of God is always profound and our response can be no less extraordinary. In the varied ministries of law, justice, and service to which the Holy Spirit is leading you, you will testify to the infinite love of God in Christ Jesus. And such a lifetime of vocation confers a great privilege. It also lays upon you a solemn responsibility. In your consecration, you publicly declared your commitment to engage in the lifelong work of justice and work of love, and service and to assume its responsibilities led by the Spirit of God. To be diligent in prayer, in the reading of the Holy Scriptures, and mutual relationship with the communities you serve, and all other means of grace available to you. To earnestly seek to carry forward your ministry, call in sincerity and love under the direction of the church, and to accept responsibility for participation in the mutually supportive deaconess and home missioner covenant community, and for a lifetime of loving and supporting your sisters and your brothers as part of the world diaconate. Do you affirm these commitments publicly and in the presence of this assembly? I do so publicly affirm this declaration with God being my helper. Today, we send you forth with our blessings and support. I'm going to allow you to stand. There's a place to serve. So I want to commission you. Jonah Ballesteros, I commission you to the appointed ministry of home missioner on behalf of the United Methodist Church. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Rosel Justo Sale, I commission you to be the appointed ministry of deaconess on behalf of the United Methodist Church. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious God of all mercies, anoint these your servants with your spirit. Enrich them with your grace, strengthen them for the task which lie ahead, and may their labors glorify your holy name as they continue their daily work in ministries of love, justice and service on behalf of the United Methodist Church. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, to those who are gathered as the church, who are present, but also present with us virtually, uh, gathered here and around the world, I present our Deaconess and Home Missioner Commission to a lifetime of Christ-like service under the authority of the church. Thanks be to God. God bless both of you. We look forward to sharing in your work together. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Thank you.
I'm Clayton Oliphant, and it is my honor to represent the delegation of the North Texas Conference. We want to thank the North Texas Conference for electing your delegates to uh, jurisdictional and general conference, which was scheduled to be in May and in July, respectively, of 2020. But COVID changed everything. It seems like the general theme for a lot of our reports. So uh, currently, I want you to know that general conference is scheduled, uh, proposed to take place August 29th through September the 7th of 2021, which means we'll have another annual conference session between now and general conference. And uh, the jurisdictional conference is scheduled to take place uh, November the 10th through the 12th, 2021 in the Woodlands, Texas. I want to just tell you what an honor it is to serve as a delegation. And ever since our election, we have been seriously taking our role very seriously in terms of preparation for the general conference when it come, whenever it comes. And um, so your, your delegation has been meeting on a, a monthly basis. We have um, studied, we have prepared, we have uh, tried to connect with delegates from around the world. We are trying to be the best prepared delegation in, uh, in all of Methodism as we go to uh, represent you. I, I want to just tell you what an honor it is to serve with this de these delegates because they are deeply devoted followers of Jesus Christ and they are very passionate about the church being, um, being the church that God is calling us to be. So I just want to thank all of them. Uh, to tell you a little bit about some of the things that we have um, proposed or are endorsing, uh, Kelly Carpenter is our lead lay delegate. Greetings, Bishop and North Texas Annual Conference. As Clayton said, I'm Kelly Carpenter. I'm a member of Union Coffee and a lay delegate to General Conference. On behalf of our delegation, it's my honor to bring a couple of recent conversations and endorsements held by our delegation. I'm going to refer to legislative items. This is just a report. You don't have to turn quickly to them. During our August virtual delegation meeting, we reviewed the petition to change discipline paragraph 807.1. This is going to be legislative item number 12 from your pre-conference workbook. It is submitted by delegation member Reverend Edlin Cowley. This petition would begin the process that will result in a new UMC insignia. In Reverend Cowley's Juneteenth article reposted on North Texas Communications, United Methodist News Service, and many other places, Reverend Cowley states, as we have the words of a new United Methodist campaign, United Methodists stand against racism. By our Council of Bishops, General Commission on Religion and Race and others, I can think of a better or more powerful, I cannot think of a better or more powerful anti-racist first step than totally rebranding our denomination. The North Texas Conference took a subsequent vote electronically, and of the 16 delegation members who participated in the poll, everyone voted to endorse Reverend Cowley's petition for a new UMC insignia. During several delegation meetings, we have also held discussions on many items coming forward, and one particularly the document and the subsequent legislative pieces that are known as the Christmas Covenant. A petition to support Central Conference leadership and the Christmas Covenant is also coming before you this afternoon in legislative item number 16 that was in the supplemental legislation on our annual conference website. We believe the connectional ties between the United States and the Central Conferences is of sacred worth. We believe in the vitality of the global church. We believe the existing structure of Methodism, of the Methodist Church, diminishes our ability to be vital and effective church and thus is no longer feasible. We believe in the conversion of central conferences into regional conferences and the creation of the United States as a regional conference, as outlined in the Christmas Covenant and affirmed in a statement by the Connectional Table published in March, which states, such legislation can provide a way for our church to remain a big tent church worldwide as we each shape ministry in our different contexts. 
During our August virtual delegation meeting, a motion was made and seconded to vote to endorse the Christmas Covenant. The vote was unanimous. Of the 19 people present on the call, everyone voted to endorse the Christmas Covenant. The North Texas Conference delegation continues the work to celebrate and affirm all people making disciples of Jesus Christ through our ministry together as the United Methodist Church. It is an honor to serve on your general and jurisdictional conference delegation. We look forward to reporting to you again at the next annual conference, and we covet your prayers on this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton and Kelly. I want to uh, say a word of appreciation to them and the members of the delegation who are serving, especially grateful for your leadership, Kelly and Clayton, uh, very, very much. And I want to uh, echo something that Clayton said about being the best prepared delegation at General Conference. This is uh, always um, seems to be uh, one of the goals of a delegation, the North Texas Conference. I knew that when I was a delegate several times, the Central Texas Conference. And so I want to say thank you for leadership current and past and ensuring that the delegation was always prepared uh, for General conference. So Clayton, Kelly, thank you for your work on that. We appreciate it very, very much. We now come to the point in time in which we're going to take up legislative matters. So I need you to turn there and we're going to move through those in these in a way. I'm taking, taking, I'll be paying particular attention to those points of order and things that you bring. I think Andy Lewis is first of all going to bring the consent calendar for, for approval as Gene Wood comes up to, to get ready to present. Thank you, Bishop. Members of the annual conference, the consent calendar has been properly before you since yesterday afternoon when it was uh, shared at both the lady session and the clergy session at about this time, again yesterday. The conference secretary has not received any requests to remove any items. Therefore, I move that the consent calendar be approved as presented on page six in the conference workbook. We're going to simply raise our hands for this, and uh, I want you to prepare to vote. And we're going to vote in about 10 seconds. Will you approve the consent calendar? No one has asked for anything to come off, so that time has passed, and so it's simply a matter of approving it. Are you? We're going to vote in 10 seconds. In five remaining. Okay. If you will vote to approve the consent calendar, will you raise your hand? It's a poll. It's a poll? Excuse me. It's a poll. Uh, then will you vote yes or no? You have 10 seconds remaining to vote. Got it. All right, passes 684 in favor, 10 against. Okay, it passes 684, 4, and 10 votes against. Okay, that is done. We'll now hear about legislative item number 13, uh, about COSRO and women in the pulpit resolution. we we'll gladly hear from Jean Wood. Jean? Thank you, Bishop McKee and members of the annual conference. <clears throat> I am Jean Wood, the outgoing chairperson of your conference committee on the status and role of women, and we are presenting legislative item 13. It is in your supplement. I am going to read it since you may not have had a chance to download it. Whereas United Methodist Churches, we practice the itinerary system, and whereas in United Methodist Churches, we believe God calls men and women as pastors, and whereas some United Methodist Churches in North Texas have never had the joy of having a female pastor and may not understand United Methodist theology behind the practice of ordaining women. And whereas it is vital for young women in the North Texas area to not only see women in leadership roles, but to imagine the possibilities of women in church leadership, both lay and clergy. Therefore, be it resolved that the North Texas Annual Conference will expect every senior pastor to preach annually in their congregation about women's ordination. 
be it further resolved that a written copy or video of the sermon will be sent to the district superintendent in the North Texas Annual Conference Commission on the Status and Role of Women with the report of attendance and the date of the worship service. Be it further resolved that the North Texas Annual Conference will recommend that every United Methodist Church in North Texas will have women, lay or clergy, preach at least four times a year. Submitted by Cosro. Comes from a committee, it does not need a second, right? Okay, it does not need a second. Is there a friendly amendment that, that was mentioned? There is. Okay, do you wanna, can we have that or is it in there already? Uh, I have the printed copy of it, if okay. you would like it. You didn't, did you read it? No, Okay, I did so not. this is before us and we know of the friendly amendments. Should we ask for the person who's making it to make a present it or would you like to do it? I know that we've talked about it, so I can't remember how we decided to do this. We've talked about it in the committee and we were willing to accept it, so it's coming from the, the committee. Coming, incoming chair of COSRO okay. for presenting it. Okay. Would is you like coming? to change yeah, this? Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and hear that now because it becomes a part of the main piece, Jean. It does. Okay. okay. You'd like to hear All it. right. We are adding a whereas. Every senior pastor is called to prepare each congregation to welcome, celebrate, and grow through the gifts of the senior pastor to follow, whether male or female. And also, uh, they have changed, uh, we've changed the be it first be resolved to say that we will invite every senior pastor to proclaim the word in the congregation with a particular emphasis, at least annually, regarding the divine intent to call all Christians, both men and women, to serve in vocations within the body of Christ and the church, including ordination and consecration. The requirement for submitting a written video or copy of the sermon has been struck and that we are inserting that the COSRO will engage in dialogue with senior pastors and the district superintendents in order to develop an instrument of receptivity that will be able to communicate congressional, congregational readiness to receive female senior pastors. Also adding a re another further resolve, the Committee on the Status and Role of Women will now submit an annual report to the next North Texas Annual Conference regarding the success of this effort. The committee will also assess the effectiveness and need for these practices. So within three years, based upon these markers of equity, church receptiveness is assessed by the district superintendents, equal representation of ordained clergywomen and appointments of churches with a membership of a thousand plus, clergy compensation, and be it further resolved that the North Texas Annual Conference will recommend that every United Methodist Church in North Texas will have women, lay or clergy, preach at least once a year, and COSRO will provide a list of female clergy who are available to fill the pulpit. Thank you. And so the COSRO has accepted that friendly amendment, is that they correct? Have. Okay, so that so the document is before us, but we do have two well now I only see one person wanting to make an amendment. I'll call them Heather Goddess, so we need to allow her to move her to um, the status where she can speak. We'll do that, Heather Goddess. Heather, are you online? Is almost ready. Bishop, can you hear me? Wait, 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 hold on a second. Samantha, were you a part of the friendly amendment that just came? She was. Yeah. Okay, so we don't, I don't need to call on her, is that correct, Jean? Okay, great. I'm sorry, Heather. Okay, That's go okay. ahead. That's okay. It's okay. Heather? Yes, Bishop. We're ready for your amendment. Oh, my amendment was part of that amendment. You're good. She was part of the conversation last oh, night, Bishop, so, and so we you, worked it in. So, okay, you were part of the conversation. So you, okay, so you, you've already, uh, it's already been addressed. Okay. Yes. So um, then the document as presented is before us from COSRO. Are there any speeches for or against? Bishop, I'd just like to have a word. Oh, I'm gonna let you have the last okay, one. I'll make sure nobody else wants them. Trust me. <laughs> okay, you may have the last word, Jean. Thank you. Thank you. One of the mandates of our committee is to be advocates for the full participation and inclusion of all women within the church. In consultation and conversations with clergy women's groups and United Methodist women, we look for a way to have more congregations experience women in the pulpit. 
from children to young people to staff parish committees, we want the role and authority of women to be represented and recognized in every church. We're celebrating this year 64 years of women's ordination in the Methodist Church. And the North Texas Conference is doing very well. We have 183 women in, in the clergy that uh, compares to 263 males. So we've got 41% that are women in the clergy. However, those churches of a thousand or more out of the 30 that we surveyed, we have five women senior pastors and 25 male senior pastors. So this is one of the places that we're going to be concentrating efforts. We want everyone to experience the joys of seeing and hearing a woman in the pulpit of your church in the next year. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Jean, and I want to thank Cosro for their work, and so I want us to prepare to vote, and this will be a poll, so you vote yes or no on this resolution from Cosro. So I want you to prepare for, to vote, and I'm going to begin the vote in about 10 seconds. So get ready. You know how to vote using the poll, and I'm going to prepare us to begin to vote. You'll have 30 seconds, so vote now either yes or no. Okay, I, again, I said it was a poll, so you vote either yes or no on the poll. We're not raising hands, so vote yes or no on the poll, not by raising your hands. Vote yes or no on the poll. Yes. Do you have to say 10 more seconds? You have 10 more seconds. Passes, uh, 634 in favor, Okay, you have uh, affirmed the resolution. It passes 634 to 97. So thank you. Jean, thank you. Thank you. Moment of personal privilege. Oh, of course. I want to express my appreciation for those who've served this quadrennium on Cosro, and especially to Reverend Emma Williams for her tireless work as our liaison to the Center for Leadership Development. My term has come to an end, but I'm confident the new committee will continue in this vital work. Thank you, Bishop. Jean, we know this is an ongoing work that must continue as we move through the next two or three quadrennium. We appreciate your work and service in doing this, and we are confident that your good work will be continued by those who follow. We now move to uh, uh, legislative uh, action number 12. This has to do with the, what was spoken about earlier, so you may turn and get this in your workbook. It's on page 57. It comes from Edlin Cowley, and it is about the North Texas Conference petition to change the discipline pursuant to paragraphs 807.10. Edlin, where are you? There you are. Right We're glad to hear you. Yes. So I just wanted to share a few words before I want to submit this, uh, share this, uh, send this to the conference. I want to share these words. On June 19th of this year, I was inspired to write an article entitled, It's Time for a New Insignia for the United Methodist Church. This article was inspired by my reflection upon the cross and flame as our insignia and how it, albeit unintentionally, uses an image of a burning cross to represent our people, our programs, and our shared ministry. The insignia itself is symbolic. The flames together represent the Pentecostal experience of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two. The two distinct tongues of flame represent the two denominations that came together to form the United Methodist Church, the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodist Church. The problem is when you put those elements together with the cross, you get a burning cross, a historically powerful image that for over a hundred years has been and is still being used today 
to assert dominance and invoke fear. As I continued to do research for the article, I was shocked to discover a Chicago Tribune article that told of an instance where the Ku Klux Klan in Kansas City, Missouri, under threat of legal action from the United Methodist Church, sent a letter to Roger Burgess, United Methodist Communications Executive, saying it would cease and desist its use of the likeness of the United Methodist insignia in its publications. In the same article, it reported that Klan members in Wisconsin had likened their ritual of cross burning to the United Methodist Church logo. The symbolic nature of the cross and flame, while beautiful, is problematic. Many African Americans, Anglos, and others have felt this way about the insignia for years. Since my article was published, I have received several emails and direct messages from fellow United Methodist clergy and laity from across the country. The great majority of those persons have expressed their belief that it is time for a change. Tim Crouch, a lay member in our conference and a fellow member of our North Texas Conference General Jurisdictional Conference delegation, who is also a member of the United Methodist Communications Board, has shared with me that United Methodist Communications is very interested in this legislation and is ready to begin the process of getting a new insignia designed if the General Conference approves this legislation. As our denomination prepares to step into its brand new future, I believe this is an excellent time to take the bold step of creating a new insignia that will be a banner that can better represent all of us, a banner under which we can all stand with pride. Approval by the North Texas Conference to submit this legislation to the General Conference would be powerful and symbolic. The United Methodist Church was born in North Texas in 1968. It would be fitting that the genesis of its rebrand and to some degree its rebirth would begin right here in North Texas. The legislation I present today is the next step on the journey to a new insignia. I say again, it's time for a new insignia for the United Methodist Church. Bishop McKee, I respectfully submit this legislation to you and to our conference for consideration. Thank you, Reverend Callie. So this is submitted to us. This is before us. And so uh, I uh, am watching the queue. There are no questions or anything that have appeared, which means if I don't see one here soon, then I assume that you're going to be ready to vote. We have something coming now. Okay, so I'm gonna, huh? Is there a second? Uh, is there a second for this, this motion? There's a second, thank you. So we have a point of inquiry. Question is, would it not make sense to wait until after GC21 to see what happens to the entire connection? Uh, Edlin, do you wanna answer that question? It comes from John Harani from Oaklawn. Uh, we could, but I would feel very confident with moving along with this now. Okay. So, uh, thank you. So, he feels confident that it's time to move along. Are there any other questions? Then I'm going to assume you're ready to vote. So, this again will, will be a poll. We're on the peti uh, petition to change discipline. Huh? There's something coming. Oh, there's something coming. Uh, Katie Cannon asks, is there a replacement symbol being proposed or created? I think you sort of spoke to this, but you want to you yeah. further clarify that, Edlin? Um, so United Methodist Communications is ready and really waiting. Uh, if General Conference do, would adopt and make that action ready, they're, they're ready to move. Mm -hmm. So they would just be waiting on the, on the go ahead from, uh, from General Conference. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm ready to vote, are they ready? We're ready to poll. Okay, we're ready to poll. So no, we're going to use the polling function, which means you vote either yes or no on this resolution that goes to general conference from the North Texas Conference. Uh, Edlin Kelly is the author, but it will come then, it will belong to the North Texas Conference. Are you ready to vote? We're going to begin to vote in 10 seconds. 
and you either vote yes or no on the poll. Five seconds. You may vote now. You have 30 seconds to vote yes or no. There are 10 seconds remaining for you to cast your vote. Okay. It's approved of 558 in favor, 176 against. You've approved this resolution that will be sent to the General Conference, 558 for, 176 against. Reverend Kelly, thank you for your work on this. We now move to uh, the resolution, uh, the legislative action number 14. Again, we'll take a poll on this vote. I just wanted you to know that as we begin to consider this, and it will be the Black Lives Matter resolution. Craig Holcomb. Hello, I am Craig Holcomb, a lay delegate from First United Methodist Church in Dallas. Yesterday, the laity session ended with a powerful message from St. Luke's Community United Methodist Church Choir. They sang a piece, the lyrics of which were, Heal Our Landlord, Praying for Our Nation in Perilous Times. Those lyrics were repeated over and over in a most moving fashion. And the video was interspersed with shots from Charlottesville with people carrying torches and shots from downtown Dallas when police officers were murdered. The Methodist Church has traditionally taken stands on important public issues. Today, I'm going to offer two res different resolutions. One regarding the pandemic, which has claimed 198,000 American lives as of today, and the other pertaining to Black Lives Matter, because Black Lives do matter the resolution pertaining to Black Lives Matter. Whereas for too long, the United States has kicked the can of racism in our country down the road. And whereas in the past few months, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Jacob Blake have been viciously attacked by police officers, resulting in the deaths of Mr. Floyd and Ms. Taylor, and uh, Mr. Blake being paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times in the back by an officer. And whereas nine black members of the Emanuel African American Episcopal Church were murdered by a white supremacist, Whereas the Black Lives Matter mission is to, quote, build local power and to intervene when violence is inflicted upon black communities by the state and vigilantes to work vigilantly for freedom and justice for black people and by extension for all people. Whereas the United Methodist Church believes that God created human beings in God's image. Whereas the social principles of the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church states, quote, the strength of, the polit of a political system depends on the full and willing participation of its citizens. The church should continually exert a strong ethical influence upon the state supporting policies and programs deemed to be just and opposing policies and programs that are unjust, unquote. Whereas the social principles of the Book of Discipline states, quote, taking an active stance in society is nothing new for followers of John Wesley. He set the example for us to combine personal and social piety 
for ever since predecessor churches to United Methodism flourished in the United States, we have been known as a denomination involved with people's lives with political and social struggles, unquote. Therefore, be it resolved that the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church supports Black Lives Matter and calls on all elected and appointed officials to immediately address the systemic racism in our law enforcement. Be it further resolved that the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church fully support all police officers who are endeavoring to do their best to preserve the peace for all of us. Respectfully submitted, Craig Holcomb. Uh, Mr. Holcomb, so um, we have uh, a couple, uh, I have some things I'm going to do this in the order in which it takes precedence. There's a point of information from Nick McRae. So, uh, Nick, I can ask this for you or we can provide, we can, um, let's, let's give him um, permission to ask the question himself, the point of information for Nick McRae. Nick, is, uh, Nick, will you ask your question? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, it was just uh, a, uh, a sort of question for clarification. I was wondering that if in the resolution, are we, would we be voting to, to support the sort of broader grassroots movement for black lives? Or are we being, uh, are we being asked to support uh, specifically the nonprofit organization Black Lives Matter Incorporated and the, the, the executives of that organization? I'm, I'm just curious because just for informational purposes. Okay, Craig, would you like to address that? Sure. We are addressing the principles and the mission of Black Lives Matter, not the specific organization. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to do this in a miss. There's an amendment to the legislative item, and I am unsure about who it is. Alan Johnson? Alan? Huh? Alan, we hear you. We're, I mean, we're waiting for you. Methodist Church in Plano. And I understand what Craig said just a moment ago, and I fully agree with what uh, Craig said about the uh, presentations yesterday. But I have submitted an amendment to this to change the legislation from Black Lives Matter to state the lives of people of color. And it deals specifically on line 16 through 19, whereas the Black Lives Matters mission is, quote, to build local power and intervene when violence is inflicted on black communities and the state and vigilantes <clears throat> and to work vigilantly for freedom and justice for black people and by extension, all people. You cannot get away from the fact that that line refers specifically to the organization Black Lives Matter. So I'm proposing that we remove line 16 through line 19 and also in line 23, 33, replace Black Lives Matters to read the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church supports justice and equality for people of color and for all people and calls on all elected appointed officials to immediately address systemic racism. The lives of black people matter, as do the lives of all people of color and surely the lives of all people matter. The organization named Black Lives Matters has goals that in some way conflict with the teachings of Christ and the United Methodist Church. 
Our 2021 budget contains funds across the spectrum for support of racial justice, equality for people of color, and indeed equality for all people and women and genders. There is no need for us to state commitment of support by the United Methodist Church for one specific organization as noted on lines 16 through 19. The wording of the revised statement of item number 14, as I've just given, shows the support for justice for people of color without tying the United Methodist Church to implied support for one single organization. Therefore, I urge you to accept the change that I've just proposed on this legislation. Thank you. Okay, so um, you have made the motion, and I should have asked for a second before you made your speech. So you've already made a speech, Alan, in favor of your motion, but I do not have a second on that. The second Okay, I do now have a second, so thank you for the speech. Craig, do you want to speak to that, or do you want us to open it for the, for the floor? How would you, would you want to speak to the amendment? Or? Yes, I would like to speak to the amendment. All people of color in this country deserve the same rights and privileges. <clears throat> However, only black people were brought to this country as slaves and were held in slavery for years. And we as white people have a history of backing away from accepting that and dealing with it directly. I do not accept this amendment because the time has come for us to accept and to deal with this problem directly. We do it in a peaceful way, we do it in a thoughtful way, we do it in a legal way, but we do it. It's time, we've kicked the can down the road long enough. Okay. I understand that uh, Dr. Ron Henderson wants to speak to this. And Ron, are you in the room? You were. Oh, he's going to be a panelist. Okay. Ron is also going to speak to this. Ron, unmute. I've done it. Oh, we can hear you now. You may speak. I'm having a problem. No, we can hear you. Okay. I'd like to speak against the amendment, uh, specifically uh, of the idea of erasing Black Lives Matter. The presenter of the motion was very clear in that he was not speaking of an organization, but of policy and of value. Uh, Black Lives Matter is of great value, and to eliminate that phrase is to devalue itself, Black Lives. Thank you. Are there any other people who wish to speak, any other persons who wish to speak? Judith, do you have a copy of the amendment? I do. Okay. Uh, of the amendment. That's what's before us. So at this time, since I see no one else. In... Okay, okay. We have another speech against the amendment. Okay. Uh, who was first? Ben, uh, will you, you want to speak against the amendment? Ben David Hensley. Okay, he's ready. Bishop, can you hear me? Bishop, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I rise to speak against this amendment, and I echo what uh, Craig Holcomb has said and also what Reverend Ron Henderson has said. Uh, the experience, or I should say, the effects of white supremacy affect the, the people of color and the communities of color 
in specifically different ways. And this resolution does not speak to how white supremacy affects uh, immigrants, part of the co community of people of colors, uh, how it affects East Asian folks, how it affects uh, Arab folks, how it affects indigenous folks. I believe that this resolution is specific to the uh, way by which we have much to repent for as a church um, and how white supremacy has oppressed black people as they have been called by white people since 1619 in efforts to defend the practice of slavery. Um, I believe it is necessary for us to name the thing a thing. As Jesus said, let our yes be yes and our no be no. I register my disagreement with this amendment. Thank you, Bishop. Okay, thank you. So I have a, um, we have a speech for the amendment. Okay. David Rucker, we will hear you unmute the speech for the amendment. David, proceed, please. I'm sorry, Bishop, I temporarily got disconnected. I'd like to speak for the amendment, and my reason is that uh, specifically the deletion of line 16 to 19, uh, unfortunately, uh, the phrase Black Lives Matter, which is embraced by almost everyone, I think, uh, is conflated with the organization Black Lives Matter Incorporated, which is anti-American and anti-Christian. And uh, you keeping those lines in uh, and in quoting from the mission of the organization makes it connect to the organization, not just to the phrase Black Lives Matter. Therefore, I support the amendment. Thank you, David. Are there any others? Because I want to move to a couple of things that have appeared on the queue. The first thing is, is I just want to speak to just one question, uh, simply because I'm uh, aware of what the budget is. No, we'll not send money to, and Craig, I think I'm speak. I don't want to speak for you, but I want to be, we will not be sending money to blacklivesmatter.org. That's not what this is about. That I agree with you completely. Okay. That was not supposed to be in effect. Yeah, it's, and so I want to answer that question for you. It's not in the budget. It's not the intent uh, at all of the conference. Uh, so just no, we will not. Um, uh, I think there is a friendly amendment. And actually, if y'all will permit me, there are two or three people who have mentioned this. Uh, can you, uh, Craig, would you be willing, will, will the body be willing for me to just go just try and do this it's an editorial correction i'm going to do this craig would you be willing to call that mother emmanuel african american episcopal church that's what they go by as mother emmanuel so would you be willing to accept that i accept that okay i knew you would so i mean i just want to make sure that uh it's an, when people say mother emmanuel I, everybody knows what they're speaking of in this country or many of us know what they're speaking of okay so that has taken care of that. I don't see any other amendments or people who wish to speak. I don't want to speak. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. So uh, they're trying to keep me straight. Shirley Eisen Newsom wished to speak against the amendment, I think. Is that correct? That sure. is correct. That is correct, Bishop. And thank you for recognizing me. I speak strongly against the amendment. Since 1619, Black people have been the only people enslaved in this nation who have gone through Jim Crowism segregation. And today we are looking at what happens when people do not value us as black people. To remove the, the, the title, the designation, black lives dilutes this resolution totally. It needs to stand as is. Thank you. There's one more, uh, I think you shifted over. Yeah, it's this one about basically calling the question, I guess. It's by Admin White. Thank you, Shirley. 
So I have um, a, move, a call for the previous question that's not debatable from Adam White. Do you want to speak to this, Adam? I mean, you don't speak to it. You just make the motion. So don't speak to it or I'm going to rule it out of order. Adam White. Adam White, speak, please. Unmute. Unmute. I do this at cabinet all the time. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Sorry about that, Bishop. Yes, I'd like to call the question and call to the vote. And that should precede um, the queue, if I'm not mistaken, um, the previous motion. So I'm calling on not the amendment, but the uh, proposed legislation before any amendment. I didn't understand anything you said. Can he do that? He says we take two thirds votes to end all debate. And then... Can he do that? Do the amendment first. Adam, you have to do the amendment first. That's what before us. You cannot call all of it. So you have to do only that which is before us. The amendment is before us. So if you want to call the previous question, you can do that, but you cannot call the previous question for everything. Okay, then I would like to call the um, the current amendment. Although I will say I did try to cue this um, You can't before. say anything. You just make the motion. I know. I'm saying that. <laughs> you can't speak to your motion to close uh, to, to the previous question. So have you moved the previous question on the amendment? Yes. Okay. I want everybody to know going forward, we've got to be careful. We can't start speaking until we get what's really before us. And uh, I'm going to be, uh, provide greater clarity than I have. So what's before you is to end debate or to end all debate and, um, on, the, on the amendment, and then that will take us to the amendment. So will you take it? It takes two-thirds vote. We're going to do it by raising hands. So we'll vote yeses if you want to end the debate on the amendment. And then after you do that, we'll take another a raise the hand for the no's on this. So it requires two thirds to close the end the debate. If you will vote to end the debate on the amendment, will you raise your hand? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to get ready. It's going to take 20 seconds to vote. So uh, now it's going to take about six seconds to be ready to vote if you want to end the debate on the amendment. Okay, we're going to vote. If you will vote to end the debate on the amendment, raise your hand now. Ten seconds left. You have ten remaining seconds to vote. Okay, it is closed. Okay, if you would vote no to ending the debate, will you vote now by raising your hand? You have 10 remaining seconds to vote no, and then we'll report the vote out. Okay, 650 of you have voted to end the debate on the amendment, and 43 have, have voted against, so the debate on the amendment is closed. So now we vote on the amendment. So are you ready? Okay, 
we vote on the amendment, get ready to vote, we'll do this um, on, uh, we'll do this by hand as well. Yes. By raising your hand. If we're going to vote on the amendment, if you will vote for the amendment, do we need to read that again? Do y'all want it, does somebody want it read again? Why don't we do it? We can show, let's, oh, it's going to show it, and that'll be, that'll, that's helpful. So this is it, so I want you to take some time to read it, and we'll scroll through it. If we could see the rest of the, are those all the changes, Judith? Uh -huh. Those are? Yeah. Okay, those are all the changes, so they're before you. So this is what we're voting on is the amendment to amend the resolution, item uh, 14 on North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church in support of Black Lives Matter to amend the resolution in the manner that you have seen there and has been spoken about. So if you would amend the resolution with th this amendment, we're, you're going to vote yes in a few moments. If you're going to vote against the amendments, then you're, we're going to give you an opportunity to vote no later. So just know this. Yes are the, are the first votes we'll take, and then no votes we'll take after we've taken the yes votes. Okay, you're ready to vote in about 10 seconds. If you want to vote in favor of the amendment, raise your hand now. You have 10 seconds remaining to vote yes for the amendment. Okay, that is closed. If you would vote against the amendment that was offered and that you have seen on the screen, will you vote no now? Left. You have 10 seconds remaining. Okay, Bishop, the amendment was defeated. Uh, 413 voted no, and 296 in favor of the amendment. Okay, the amendment was defeated. There were 296 who voted for the amendment and 413 who voted no. The, the resolution is before us intact as it was presented and um, Craig Holcomb has agreed to accept Mother Emmanuel uh, for African American Episcopal Church, so we'll know that. And I apologize for getting that wrong. You know, if that's the biggest mistake any of us make today, we'll be okay. Yeah. Okay, we're going to vote unless anybody wants to speak. And I don't see it coming to the queue. I've not been informed anybody is. One, uh, Gary Stevens has a question that hasn't been addressed. Uh, he does? What is it? Gary, do you have, Gary Stevens, do you have a question? Hmm? We're moving him over. It's been done. Okay. Gary Stevens is in. Gary, be sure you unmute and then. I did. Uh, yes, I did have a question, Bishop. It's an informational question. Uh, so, line 17 through 19 uh, state a claim of a quote of the mission of the Black Lives Matter. I've tried to look for it online to find the full text since there's a dot, dot, dot in the middle of the quote. I wanted to see what the full mission looked like. I have found several missions so far that do not match this one. So I wanted to know 
A, what the full text is, and B, what is the source of the quote? So I want to help us here for a moment, Gary, because basically you didn't get the, you're not referring to the amendment, you're referring to the resolution, is that correct? Yeah, it's an informational question on the, uh, yeah, you said we were back on the motion, right? Yeah, I mean, okay. I mean, so, so the question is basically, that's in the document, the answer to your question, I'm going to read, we'll read lines 17 through 19 for you. Um, no, I have that in front of me, Bishop. I'm sorry. So, I mean, can you help us hear what it is you're asking? Because I'm, we need okay. to look. The, the, the legislative item 14, line 17 to 19 says, Black Lives Matter mission is, quote, and in the middle of that quote, there's a dot, 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 which means normally that words have been left out. And so I went online to find the full wording of the mission. I cannot find it. So I wanted to know the full wording of the mission and what document is being quoted. I got that quote off of Black Lives Matter. As I remember it, I clicked on mission. The uh, dot, dot, dot was because there was language there that I didn't think was, uh, was just going to make the thing, the resolution longer, and long experience has taught me that shorter is better. <laughs> okay, but I, but I went to their website. Uh, am I still on, Bishop? Just calling the previous question. Okay. Gary, I, I didn't catch what you said. Um, I, I went to the website he referred to, and it does not have that anymore. Okay. Okay. So we have someone who is calling the question, I understand. Jeffrey Moore. Okay, they're moving Jeffrey Moore. G-O-E. G-E-O, isn't it? Okay, Jeffrey, we'll hear from you. You need to unmute. Yes, I'm waiting for technology to catch up. Move to call the previous question. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I hear a second in the house. So this is no debate. If you, uh, the previous question has been called, it requires two thirds, get ready to vote. We're going to vote by using the hand. If you will move the previous question, which is then to, um, the, then we'll vote, it shuts off debate. Will you vote yes by raising your hand? Seconds. You have 10 seconds remaining. Okay, if you would vote no, would you raise your hand? I move too quickly from yeses to noes. So. I move too quickly from yeses to noes. <laughs> okay, those of you who... Now we're, ready to, now we're ready to vote for no. If you'd vote no on calling the question, I apologize for that. Will you, will you raise your hand? We have 10 seconds remaining to vote no. Okay. All right. 
It passed. Okay. 480, yes. 76. No. Okay, it has passed. Debate is closed. We'll now vote on the resolution as it has been presented and amended, which is the insertion of Mother Emanuel Church. Okay, if you will vote for the resolution, will you, uh, we're going to take a poll on this one. And will you vote yes? If you oppose the resolution, will you vote no? Prepare to vote. Vote now on the resolution before you. Okay, it's up now. Ten seconds. You have ten seconds remaining to vote. Okay, Bishop. Uh, it's approved. Four hundred eighty-one in favor. Two hundred thirty-eight against. You've approved the resolution, uh, 481 to 238. Okay, it is passed. Um, Craig Holcomb, the pandemic resolution now. Uh, I'm going to read the resolution. Now, in it, I refer to the date, August 11th. I want to make it clear that date has no significance other than it happened to be the date on which I wrote the resolution. Resolution of the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas as of 11 a.m. on August 28th, I'm sorry, it was August 28th, not 11th, 5.8 million cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed in the United States of America and 180,731 deaths have been confirmed. And whereas as of 11 a.m. on August 28th, 2020, 24.4 million cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed worldwide and 831,961 deaths have been confirmed. And whereas the social principles of the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church states, quote, we cannot just uh, be observers. So we care enough about people's lives to risk interpreting God's love, to take a stand, to call each of us into a response, no matter how controversial or complex, unquote. And whereas containing the spread of COVID-19 virus can best be achieved by all persons wearing face masks, practicing social distancing of six feet, frequently washing their hands and being tested for the virus. Therefore, be it resolved that the people of the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church are resolute in their desire to stop COVID-19 pandemic from harming more of our brothers and sisters, be it further resolved that all people should wear face masks, practice social distancing of six feet, frequently wash their hands, and be tested for the virus. Okay, so the resolution is before you, and I see nothing in the queue. I want to remind you, we do have a hard stop. Uh, we are to be out of here at 3 o'clock. It doesn't mean we end at 3 o'clock. And so what I want to do is, is you want to vote on the resolution, um, and this way you can move to the other resolutions because there's a time at which we do have to draw to a close. Okay? Okay, Scott Gilliland. Yes, Bishop, I call the question. Okay, so the question's been called. It's not debatable. It requires a two-thirds vote. We will take this by raising the hand. So prepare to vote. We have a poll. We have a poll, Bishop. We have a poll on, on calling the question? Oh, sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Yeah. Just cool. <laughs> I was right on that one. <laughs> this is on raising the hand. 
so if you will uh, support calling the question, there'll be no debate, no amendments, and just moving forward this, will you raise your hand by voting yes? In a moment, we'll close that and raise our hands for no. But let's prepare to vote. Vote yes to call the question. Okay, so Scott, I'm gonna have to rule you out of order because we cannot call the question until three people have spoken per the standing rules of the North Texas Conference. Okay, so we'll listen to three people, but there was no one in the queue, so there was no one that was willing to speak. So do you wanna speak, anybody? Is anybody coming in? Okay, then I'm gonna rule that we can call the question. We're gonna start this again. If you will vote yes to, what? Huh? We have a speech, Michael Dorff. Michael Dorff has a speech? Is that what you're saying, Michael Dorff? Okay. Okay, uh, Michael Dorff is moving in to speak. Uh, he's in. Michael? Well, Bishop, if you, if you have ruled that we can move on, I, I don't need to speak. Well, no, it's fine. Go ahead. I would just like to say that uh, I, I support the resolution, and I think everyone should wash their hands frequently. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. You support the resolution in what? And everyone should wash their hands frequently. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we'll now, uh, does anybody else want to speak or we can dispense with even calling the question? If you don't mind me sort of moving through this, would, is that agreeable to you? I don't see anybody coming to the queue. So we're gonna vote on the resolution. So if you will vote in favor of the resolution this time, will you raise your hand? This is a poll. This is a You ought to watch Andy and I do comedy if you think this is something. Okay, so this is a poll. Will you vote yes in support of the res if you support the resolution or vote no if you don't support it? It's a poll. Vote now. You have 30 seconds. seconds are remaining to vote. All right, Bishop, it's approved. We have 603 in favor, 122 against. Okay, you have approved this resolution, 603 in favor, 122 against. It's done. Okay, so we have two resolutions left. That's provided we get to both of them. Uh, I think we can do one. We'll see how that goes, and then we'll take the second. But there will be a time, and there's no way in which we can negotiate this time with St. Andrew. We have to be out of here so that they can turn this room over. It is the only place set up for us to do this work today, and so that's the way in which we'll proceed. That's the agreement. Jessica, legislative, Victoria, legislative uh, item, excuse me, yeah, number 16. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I am going to move more quickly through this than I would like because there are two pieces of legislation I'd like to get through. So this particular piece of legislation relates to the Christmas covenant, which uh, comes from our central conferences, as Kelly and Clayton mentioned in their delegation report. The um, North Texas General Conference delegation did vote in support of the Christmas Covenant. A couple of things that I want to briefly say about the Christmas Covenant. First, um, the purpose of the Christmas Covenant, if I was going to give a one sentence summary, is to create regional conferences throughout the United Methodist Church, which um, provides us an increased structural capacity to be able to minister in our own context throughout the global United Methodist Church. The importance of this is that it maintains and continues our connectional relationship throughout the global United Methodist Church and also allows us to continue our mission together. Um, 
in addition, it is extremely important in my perspective that we take this action to support the leadership of our central conferences. This comes, as I said, from the leadership of the central conferences. I've had the uh, honor throughout the past year or so to be able to be present while our central central conference leaders were working on the Christmas Covenant legislation and in subsequent conversations that they've had attempting to promote the Christmas Covenant legislation. Um, I want to be clear on a couple of myths or points of information that I've been asked specifically as it relates to the Christmas Covenant and the protocol. And to be very clear, there is nothing within the Christmas Covenant legislation that conflicts or would otherwise prohibit support of the protocol. So if that's a concern, that should not be a concern. And then a logistics issue to keep in mind, this does not pass the Christmas covenant. I wish that we had that power, but we don't. Um, this is just a resolution sharing with the global United Methodist Church and the general conference at the North Texas Conference supports the Christmas Covenant and our central conferences in bringing that forward. So with that quick overview, I will pass it to debate. Okay, so this is before us. So are there any, first of all, are there any questions of clarity or does anybody wish to speak? And I see no one in the queue. I'm gonna give it a few moments to, uh, to see what happens here. Okay, so if you um, prepare Rob Spencer to get into the queue, and he'll speak for when he speaks, I think that's what he's in. So Rob, we hear from you. Yes, sir. Bishop uh, Alfer and conference offer a speech for the Christmas covenant, a covenant that through re regionalization levels the, uh, the playing field across the globe as we continue our mission together. As Jessica said, this covenant comes from beyond the US. It comes from our sisters and brothers in central conferences, specifically the Philippines earlier this year. It's an honor to serve on our delegation and I was very pleased that our delegation after great discussion voted unanimously to endorse the Christmas covenant. I encourage you to vote yes, thank you. Okay, is there any, thank you. Are there any other speeches in the queue, either for or against? Rachel Bachman, for. Okay. She's in. Rachel Bachman? Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop. I also am rising to speak for this resolution for the Christmas Covenant. Um, I think that this is uh, precisely the time that we need to show the kind of unity and support of our global connection while still moving forward and making progress in what has held us in tension for many, many years. This gives us an opportunity to act in different contexts with different solutions by creating regionalization across the globe. Um, we, won't, we won't be able to um, fully move into this in, in one year, but it does move us toward um, a place in the church that will have greater equity um, across across the board. And so I stand in support of this motion. Okay, thank you. Are there any other speeches in the queue? Jill Jackson Sears. I would like a point of clarification. Could you please name all of the central conferences that supported this covenant? Jessica, can you provide information on that? What central conferences supported it? So I don't know that I can provide a complete answer on that. It was passed and comes forth from the Philippine Central Conference. There are um, other central conferences in Africa that have supported it, but I don't have a comprehensive list in front of me of the, um, those whose annual conferences have voted in formal support. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions in the queue? Okay, so we have a motion to call the question. Uh, this is not, uh, and actually it's not needed if there's no other debate. So, and we don't see any other debate. So we can save a, a little time here and just w vote whether we're gonna approve this or not. And so I don't see anybody raising any objections. So we're going to vote. If you would vote for legislative item number 16, this is a poll. 
If you will vote for this, you will vote yes. If you will not support this, you will vote no. We begin voting now, and you have 30 seconds. Says do it. Huh? Says do the last resolution. Do the last one. Okay. Ten seconds. You have ten seconds remaining on the vote. Okay, you have passed this resolution, 579 in favor, 120, excuse me, 127 against uh, to approve legislative item number 16, which expresses the conference's support of the Christmas covenant. Your delegation has already done that. Okay, we can do this last resolution, but if we get into a lot of debate, we're going to sort of be in trouble here. So Jessica, go. I promise to be as brief as a lawyer can you be. No, go no, ahead. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Okay. I've already crossed the line. Um, this resolution is in support of young or, or youth and young adult leaders in the church. Um, I do want to briefly share a question that was posed by one of our youth members from FEMC DeSoto earlier today. And um, I think this highlights why this resolution is so important. And her question was in the course of debate, what are the ideas of the conference to help ensure that justice within the church? Church is served and that we people of color are heard and responded to clearly. Um, we so often talk about our youth and young adult leaders as if they are the church of tomorrow. But the reality of the situation is that our youth and young adult leaders are the church of today, just as much as they're the church of tomorrow. And um, mm -hmm. I've authored this piece of legislation with um, Shandon Klein and Katie Cannon. And the purpose of this is really for the conference to recognize publicly and at a, a formal level that our youth and young adults are full members of the church and we should not be using them as tokens on boards and committees and commissions that they have perspective and insight and um, say in the church that it is important for us to consider and being mindful in taking those perspectives and opinions and voices into consideration is um, is part of the imperative nature of ensuring that the church will be sustainable and inclusive going into the future and also um, that we have a church to sustain because ultimately while we are the church of today we are also the church of tomorrow so that being said uh, it's a support and a resolution in support of our young and uh, youth leadership and i will close it with that thank you so uh, I'm going to, uh, I see no questions or anything else before us, and I think we should just go ahead, that we should proceed with voting on this resolution. And so um, we're going to take the poll, and I'm not trying to shut off debate, but I don't know that that's really something of which you will want to debate. I don't want to make that judgment for you, but I would imagine that to be the case, knowing the good people you are in terms of, uh, of, of this matter. So be ready to vote. Be ready to vote. If you will vote yes for resolution for this resolution in the poll, uh, legislative item number 17, supporting young leadership resolution, will you vote yes? If you're not in favor of this resolution, you may vote no in the poll. Prepare to vote. We will vote now. You have 30 seconds. You have 10 remaining seconds to vote.
absence. 654 in favor. 60. 60 zero. Against. Okay, so it passes. The, res the resolution passes 654 for and 60 against. So that passes. This concludes the business that we have before us. Let me close with a couple of quick things. And I know we have to move on. I want to say that in many ways this has been an experiment and we've been building a bridge as we move forward uh, across it. And I said earlier that um, uh, we changed the date and we changed the date and then we changed the way in which this would happen. I cannot thank uh, the St. Andrew United Methodist Church staff, and we've, we've called them, and I don't know where Kyle Fote is or Kay Richardson. Are y'all in the back of the room? Or for, oh, there's Kay. And so let me, let me just, wait, 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 yeah, okay. So we want to give you some thanks, and um, uh, we appreciate it very much. Kay, I'll be in touch on behalf of the annual conference. I owe you lunch. I owe Kyle lunch. That's about all the lunches I think I owe, but if I may need some more, or we'll just get Robert to take us all to lunch. But anyway, I want to say, I cannot thank St. Andrew enough. I mean, they, uh, at some great expense on their own, you know, we, we did this and we... All of the staff. I want to thank our communication staff and some of our some of our extended cabinet has been helping field questions and do run the the back of the house in terms of what you see on the screen and things of that nature and monitor the questions and correct me when I've been wrong. So they've been ex very very busy today and I want to thank you. I want to thank the wonderful people of the North Texas Conference who've hung in here today with us. I understand that I've got to see the video of the lady session laity session yesterday. I hear it was just outstanding and I think we will post that on the website much of what you have seen and some of you some of what was um, prepared for you to see after annual conference will be on the website we will send you notifications of that and so um, I want to say that I think we've given good work considering the time in which we had the manner in which we were able to do it and it just goes to show that um, we are more adaptable than we sometimes think. So thank you all for being present. I hope that you have a wonderful celebration uh, Sabbath tomorrow. I want to say that a church is the Metro District. You'll be hearing from, uh, from me and from Deborah Hobbs Mason this coming week. And as we open churches, remember the protocol, stay in place, mask, physical distancing, I assume everybody washes their hands. I mean, I hope you listened to your mother growing up. That's the guess of what I'm saying. Wash your hands, and there'll be no singing. I mean, we are going to make sure that not one church in the North Texas Conference, the United Methodist Church, is a spreader. And uh, that means that most of our people will be very safe, at least from going to church. God bless you. I simply want to offer this simple benediction to you. It is as if the world is changing and moving under our feet. It seems as if we cannot keep pace with this rapid change that is happening. And the COVID-19 virus probably has accelerated that in ways we did not know would happen. And we probably will come from this, we will have learned more, been much more adaptive in terms of what we do and been much more imaginative. I cannot think of a pandemic ever being a blessing in any shape, form or fashion. I can think that the responses you, the clergy and the laity of the North Texas Conference have made during this time have been a blessing. And I'm reminded about the Apostle Paul's words, so let's be careful about what we ascribe to God. And that is, we know that in everything, it's not that God wills everything, but in everything God is still able to work for good with those who love God according to his purposes. Friends, thank you for being the willing instrument of God's good, effective grace in a time that we can't believe has happened, but is still going on. God bless you. God bless the Church of the North Texas Conference. And I so deeply appreciate being able to serve uh, you as your bishop. God bless you. Good afternoon.